William died on August 2nd, 1997, at 6.30 in the afternoon from complications from a massive heart attack he'd had the night before. He was 83 years old. I was with William Burroughs when he died, and it was one of the best times I ever had with him. Doing Tibetan Nyingmapa Buddhist meditation practices, I absorbed his consciousness into my heart. It seemed like a bright white light, blinding but muted. I was the vehicle, his consciousness passing through me. A gentle shooting star went in my heart and up the central channel and out the top of my head to a pure field of great clarity and bliss. It was very powerful. William Burroughs resting in great equanimity and the vast primordial expanse of primordial wisdom mind. I was staying in William's house doing my meditation practices for him, trying to maintain the good conditions and dissolve any obstacles that might be arising for him at that moment in the bardo. William had a high degree of realization, but he was not a completely enlightened being. I had great confidence in his capabilities. Lazy, alcoholic, junky William. And I didn't allow any doubt to arise in my mind because it might allow doubt to arise in William's mind. I had to proceed fearlessly with absolute confidence. Now I had to do it for him. What went into William Burroughs' coffin with his dead body? On August 6, 1997, Tuesday at 1 in the afternoon, James Grauholz and Ira Silverberg came to William's house to pick out the clothes for the funeral director to put on William's dead body. The clothes were in a closet in my room, and we picked out the things that would go into William's coffin and grave, accompanying him on his journey in the underworld. His favorite gun, a 38 spe snub nose special, fully loaded with five shots. He called it the snubby. This is very important, I said. William always said, you can never be too well armed in any situation. Of his more than 100 world-class guns, it was his favorite. He often wore it on his belt during the day and slept with it every night, fully loaded, under the bed sheet on his right side. A gray fedora. He always wore a hat when he went out, and we wanted his consciousness to feel at ease dead. His favorite cane, a sword cane made of hickory with a light rosewood finish. A sport jacket, black with a dark green tint. We rummaged through his closet and it was the best of his shabby clothes and smelling sweet of him. Blue jeans, the least worn ones were the only ones clean. A red bandana, he always wore one in his back pocket. Jockey underwear and socks. Black shoes, the ones he wore when he performed. I thought the old brown ones, the ones he wore every day because they were comfortable. But James said, there's an old CIA slang that says getting a new assignment is getting new shoes. A white shirt 
We'd bought it in Beverly Hills, in a men's shop in Beverly Hills, in 1981 on the Red Knight Tour. It was his best shirt. All the others were a bit ragged. It had become tight. He'd lost a lot of weight, and we thought it would fit. A necktie, hand-painted by William. A Moroccan vest, green velvet with a gold brocade trim, given him by Brian Geisen 25 years before. In his lapel buttonhole, the rosette of the French government's commandeur des arts et lettres, and the rosette of the American Academy of Arts in Letters, honors which William very much appreciated. A gold coin in his pants pocket, a gold 19th century Indian head $5 piece symbolizing all wealth. He would have enough money to buy his way in the underworld. A ballpoint pen, the kind he always used. He was a writer and sometimes wrote longhand. His eyeglasses in his outside jacket pocket. A joint of really good grass. Heroin. Just before the funeral, Grant Hart slipped a small white paper packet into William's pocket. Nobody's going to bust him, said Grant. William, bejeweled with all his adornments, was traveling in the underworld. I Kissed Him, an early LP album of Us Together, 1975, was called Biting Off the Tongue of a Corpse. I kissed him on the lips, but I didn't do it. 